All right, thanks everyone for joining us for our event on transnational migration deterrence and the possibilities for abolish ICE with Jenna Lloyd, Allison Mounts, and Naomi Paik. Um, I, I'm Nicole Wynn, I'm an Associate Professor of Educational Policy Studies here at UIC. Um, and I just wanna thank the Humanities Institute and the Institute for Research on Race and Public Policy for co-sponsoring the event um, and also providing the logistical support to make the event uh, possible. Um, just two housekeeping items before we get started. The first is that there is a Q&A function available for you to drop in um, any questions you have. You can drop the questions in as the speakers are talking uh, and we'll have a Q&A session after the three panelists uh, speak. Um, so you can use that function. The chat isn't, you can't chat with each other but you can use a Q&A to communicate questions uh, that you have. And then there's also closed captioning available. You can hit the closed caption button on your screen and then we'll have, we have two ASL interpreters uh, with us as well. So those are the two housekeeping details. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Patricia Macias Rojas, uh, who's an associate professor in sociology and Latin American and Latin studies at UIC. Uh, her research examines the historical, economic and political connections between the detention deportation uh, and mass incarceration. And she's the author of the award-winning book From Deportation to Prison, The Politics of Immigration Enforcement in Post-Civil Rights America. Um, so welcome to Patricia, and she's gonna serve as our moderator for today. So I'll get started and, and introduce our first speaker. I should say that you know, I'm also a member of the Race and Empire Working Group um, here at the Humanities Institute. And um, it started as just this kind of intellectual community where we would get together and read and invite speakers. And it's, it's been such a, such a really fantastic um, intellectual and political community for me here at UIC. So we're super excited to, to have this, this panel as part, of, as part of the Race and Empire Working Group. And so, I'm going to uh, introduce our first speaker, and then our speaker will present, and, and I'll do the introductions right before folks uh, present. And so I have the honor of uh, introducing uh, the feminist geographer and abolitionist Jenna Lloyd, who's an associate professor of geography at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. And uh, uh, Jenna Lloyd's earlier work um, sort of looks at health and violence and grassroots mobilizations around health and health justice. Um, I know her work on, on border rights issues. Uh, she co-edited a really important book called Beyond Walls uh, and Cages uh, that was one of the earlier edited volumes looking at the intersections between uh, immigration and um, the criminal legal system. And uh, most recently, she uh, co-authored a book with Alison Muntz, um, uh, which is called Be, uh, Boats, Borders, and Bases. Uh, so we're super excited to, to have you here, Jenna. Thank you so much, Patricia. Um, how is my, is my sound okay? Somebody can tell me if it's not. Um, thank you to P Patricia and Nicole. Um, and Yvonne for starting us um, off. And thank you to the UIC Institute um, for the Humanities, Race and US Empire Working Group. Um, and to interpreters, our interpreters for today, Kathy and Barbara and Tina, um, I appreciate uh, everything that you've done to bring us together um, for this conversation with Allison Mounts and Naomi Paik, um, with whom I've been in conversation for some time. And so um, it's good to see you um, even remotely. Um, so I want to start off with offering my perspectives at the outset on this question of transnational migration deterrence and the possibilities of abolish ICE um, and then spend the rest of my time explaining how I got to these basic conclusions. So first, uh, migration deterrence, which is I define as efforts to prevent people who are on the move from safely reaching their, their destination. Migration deterrence does not just take place at the border or imagined interface between the so-called domestic and foreign. 
uh, migration deterrence is itself transnational uh, project that materially blurs, but ideologically reinscribes the space of the nation. So migration deterrence involves criminal law and asylum law, domestic policy and foreign policy, civilian and military branches of government. Because migration deterrence is more expansive than ISIS operations, however expansive, um, the movement to abolish ICE then must also be a movement to abolish migration deterrence. And finally, because migration deterrence is a transnational phenomenon, the movement must be and already is transnational. So let me um, give you some background as to um, how I got to this place by explaining um, the work that Allison Mounts and I did in both borders and faces. So I will share my screen. Let's see. Uh, and this is the cup. <laughs> I'll come back to the image at the top of the uh, cover. So Boats, Borders, and Bases, in my view, provides um, the immediate historical and conceptual framework um, to understand US migration deterrence in terms of US imperialism and war making. And I think we'll see um, from Naomi's work a longer historical perspective on, on this issue, um, and from Allison, a broader geographic perspective on this issue. So from the US context, this framing uh, around US imperialism and war making to explain and understand migration detention and deterrence is a different frame than how um, the issue was being debated when Allison and I began working together um, before this project, but around 2007, if you can believe that, Allison. Um, so Boats, Borders and Bases as a book project is marked by a series of crises which we can talk about how we understand that. And the political dynamics that then seize to, um, aim to seize opportunity that crisis represents to make some sort of reform. So the first of these moments of crisis um, that framed this project was over the border, border patrol apprehensions that were taking place um, and stops in Syracuse, New York which is where we were both living at the time. Allison and I were both living at the time. Um, and that became the emphasis of chapter six of, um, of our book. The next was a moment um, at, of crisis over deaths in ICE detention, which is depicted um, by, in the lower portion of the screen, an image of a headline reading, ill and in pain, detainee dies in US hands. And so a series of reports by the journalist Nita Bernstein brought a great deal of attention to the detention system at the time. And hence um, a report issued by Deborah Shariro, um, which is in that right hand part of the screen, um, looking at her recommendations for how to reform migration detention. And then finally, so this is the sort of initial framing of the project, um, at least in the US context. Um, we were writing, finishing writing this book as the Trump administration was working to dismantle, further dismantle asylum, um, fundamentally dismantle refugee resettlement and also bulk, bulk up border militarization, migration policing and deportations. So as we know from Ruth Wilson Gilmore, crisis, and I'll quote her, is not objectively bad or good, rather it signals systemic change whose outcome is determined through struggle. And so when we say crisis within this text, it is um, trying to understand these different pivotal moments in which um, different um, uh, groups of people within administration, but also uh, people living in places where, for example, detention facilities might be cited or might not be, um, how it is that they um, understood that particular moment and mobilized um, around it. So this book project uh, came out of a global research project that Allison was leading 
Um, and I was one of the people who was working on the US part of that story. So at the time that Nina Bernstein was writing these articles um, and there was a great deal of discussion about um, detention, there were some 30,000 beds in prison terminology in the system, which is the term that is used to um, uh, enumerate how much confinement space there is for on any one day to um, confine people. So to give a sense for the current moment, ICE requested funds for 54,000 um, space for 54,000 people on any one day for this fiscal year 2020. So the director of the Office of Detention Policy and Planning for ICE, Dora Schreiro, she issued a report that called for major reforms to the system. Then as now, migration detention is conducted uh, in hundreds of facilities across uh, space um, that range from publicly owned and privately operated to privately owned and privately operated to subcontracted jail spaces, county jails that receive per diems for each individual. So what Shariro, call, Shariro called for, among other things, was greater, and I'll quote her, capacity within the organization to assess and improve detention operations and activities without the assistance of the private sector. So the obvious but unstated implication um, for the reform she was calling for was that her ideal was, would be a fully public system um, and, but for that ideal to be realized, there would then need to be an expansion of prison space. So instead of using jail facilities, the federal government would need to construct new space to move the majority of people who were, say, within jail space out of those jails, which would still exist, and into the federal system. So what she was essentially saying was that this would uh, be an expansion, uh, although that wasn't directly stated within uh, the report. Accompanying her, um, her report were a series of, of maps, this is one of them, um, that uh, sought to explain where some of these detention facilities should be located using terminology, sort of economic terminology like demand, the detention demand as if somebody uh, demands to um, be put in detention. So that language, uh, economic language of demand clearly naturalizes what is actually a political project, not um, an economic one. Um, and when I showed this map, map to the cartographer, Mark Monmanier, uh, and he took a look at it, he immediately said, oh, this is just cartographic fog, uh, by which he meant it was um, sort of very, just sort of bright and shiny, but wasn't explaining a whole lot. Um, and we can also take a look at that ourselves and question um, just by the sort of blob of, of the sort of color spreading out across space, right? Demand spreads into the Gulf of uh, Mexico, right? It spreads out into the Pacific Ocean through the Atlantic. It's in many ways nonsensical, um, but the spectacular aspect of this kind of map tried to rationalize and make it look as if by drawing upon mappings, um, the sense that mapping is a rational project to um, underscore the claims that she was making to expand the system. So this narrative frame um, driving this reform moment um, about 12 years ago was an ostensible distinction between public and private and an exclusive framing of domestic space. So within none of these maps were any of the facilities outside of the 48 contiguous states, none of them were mentioned, although there is detention um, and border activity taking place elsewhere. So in the course of writing um, our book, then we came to understand this domestic framing as a deeply ide ideological one and the product of at least two imperial moments. The first, the establishment of the US-Mexico boundary uh, through war and ongoing settler efforts to consolidate that territory. And the second, more immediate, Cold War deflection of the effects of US war um, 
efforts and war making and imperialism. And both of these um, are overlapping um, and are racialized moments. Um, and so too have been the categories through which the US state has cast people on the move as economic migrants, refugees, asylum seekers, et cetera, these different legal categories through which the state has sought to understand people. So these terms too have an ideological history um, in producing the distinction between foreign and domestic space and policy. So our retelling of this current history of the world's largest detention and deportation system expanded the scale of analysis from the nation state to the scale of US empire and examined the contingent geographies of deterrence and detention infrastructure. So our first um, chapter discusses U.S. resettlements of Vietnamese refugees in the 1970s into the 1980s um, through U.S. military bases. Um, and it also then um, turns to local case studies, so sort of expanding out the scale of where it is that the U.S. Um, has um, operations, let's say, investigation of local cases within Louisiana and Arizona to also get at um, how it is that detention facilities came to be cited in those places. So at the time that we began this research, most advocates pointed to 1996 criminalization legislation as the roots of the crisis of detention. Um, and we certainly, that did expand the system. We begin our story though more um, immediately in the 1970s with relentless, truly relentless efforts to prevent Haitian asylum seekers from finding refuge in the United States. So bringing histories of asylum seeking into the history of detention uh, is important because it shows how detention became an anchor in escalating, in an escalating logic of deterrence that over time um, evolved into or encompass an equally expansive logic of criminalization. So I'll, I'll give you some sense of, of, of a bit of this story. So at a 1983 Republican Party uh, fundraising dinner, President Reagan warned of a, I'll quote him, a tidal wave of refugees, and this time they'll be beat people and not boat people, swarming into our country. So he was responding to critics who were decrying US, the US backing of governments in Guatemala and El Salvador, and also the Contras in Nicaragua, um, and thereby US complicity in devastating appearance, disappearances, massacres, and displacement of people. So in 1984, only 4% of the Guatemalan and Salvadoran um, asylum seekers who were making claims in the United States, only 4% of those claims were approved. So his invocation of a communist red scourge threatening Central America and flooding into the United States was simultaneously an attack on the freedom of movement and the right to seek asylum. So the specter of boat people that Reagan most proximately referenced um, was the 1980 mass migration often called the um, Mariel boat lift in which 125,000 Cuban and 25,000 Haitian asylum seekers made their way by boat to Florida over a short six month period of time. So his administration had vowed to never let another Marielle, and that's all over the archival literature, another Marielle happen again. Um, so uh, by virtue of, of not wanting that to take place, they established his administration, established a two pronged deterrence strategy of mandatory detention and interception at sea. So mandatory detention had a bit of a longer uh, story. It had been used during the Carter administration as Haitians began to leave the country with worsening economic and political conditions under the Duvalier dictatorship. Immigration officials in Florida began detaining Haitians who could not post bond. And then they created what they called very creatively um, the Haitian program to accelerate the removal of Haitians from South Florida. A district, uh, US district court judge ruled that the program was, quote, a transparently discriminatory program designed to deport Haitian nationals and no one else. When Reagan uh, took office, 
this administration had the chance to um, change this uh, discriminatory policy um, to do so uh, rather than um, ending the policy of detention, he just expanded it more broadly in a more blanket sense so that um, anybody then would be subject to detention, not simply um, patients. Um, and so more people became um, essentially became detained. So nearly 15 years later, Janet Reno, who was Bill Clinton's attorney general, announced the Border Patrol's 1994 strategic plan. And this is a map um, showing, sort of infamous map showing the strategic plan. Um, and she argued that this plan was necessary to establish a border for the first time. It, so this is hyperbolic language. A border certainly existed. Um, and as you can see from the imagery of these giant um, uh, arrows, right? driving into um, the country, the sense that the territory was under threat um, and needed to be fortified. So this, this plan has been written about quite a lot. Uh, it's known to um, a number of both organizers and certainly researchers because of instituting the program of prevention through deterrence, a policy that pushed uh, cross-border migrants uh, who were uh, moving on land into more treacherous environments um, and thereby by leading to more exploitative and dangerous conditions of, of transit um, and deaths in the desert. So what is the relationship between the boat people whom Reagan warned about and the lawless US-Mexico borderlands that Re Reno invoked? And here, when I use both of those terms, I'm signaling their ideological valence with which they were using them. So in December 1994, a couple of months after the Border Patrol launched Operation Gatekeeper in San Diego, the government of Panama told the United States that it would no longer permit the US to use um, Howard Air Force Base, um, which was one of its, there's where it's bases, my water, um, it would no longer allow the US to use Howard Air Force Base for Cuban asylum seekers who the US had intercepted at sea. So the announcement came at the end of a series of what the Defense Department called disturbances during which two Cubans died, 30 people suffered injuries and 221 US soldiers were wounded. And before these um, uh, disturbances transpired, a number of people had tried to commit suicide as well. So this um, particular moment in encampment was part of a trans, the transnational scope of the second prong of Reagan's deterrence policy, which is interception at sea, which became particularly evident in the early to mid 1990s through the Bush and Clinton administrations. This is an image during the Clinton administration. So Clinton, established a regional safe haven policy um, in response to an uptick in Cuban and Haitian people trying to reach the US by boat. Um, and they used military bases, US military bases in Pan Panama and Guantanamo that were part of an archipelago of military and civilian spaces that were either planned or in some cases established as uh, safe havens in the Caribbean. This gives a sense of the broad extent of um, these uh, places. So at the time the Border Patrol issued the 1994 strategic plan, which we know mostly for its effects in, the, in say Arizona and Texas, costs for the Caribbean safe haven were running $30 million a month. And despite the scale of these operations, um, this was not depicted within that map, it was uh, downplayed within that map and not discussed within the report. And so this story of safe haven within the Caribbean tends not to be told alongside that of gatekeeper. So why the concerted effort to rule out gatekeeper even as sovereign power was clearly on display in the Caribbean? We argue that the strategic erasure of US bordering practices in um, the Caribbean fixed attention on the US-Mexico borderlands, both reproducing settler sovereignty and distracting from the shifting Cold War stance towards Cubans 
is a longer story. Um, but previously they had been admitted much more fle freely to the United States, as well as disquieting images of refugees enclosed on military bases. So safe haven, uh, this is uh, Guantanamo, an image of, of um, the living conditions on Guantanamo at that time. Uh, at that time in other regions in the world, this idea of safe haven was also being deployed. So in Iraq, uh, Bosnia, Rwanda, um, none of those had gone particularly well. So part of our argument is that um, uh, this was not a story that was, <laughs> that was um, demonstrating US sovereignty in ways that were uh, uh, put, put the US in a particularly good light. So ideologically fixing the border to the US-Mexico borderlands simultaneously was telling an old racialized story of lawlessness and economic migration. The Southern border spectacle deployed in the 1994 plan had the immediate and enduring effect of funneling attention and anxiety over border control away from the Caribbean and isolating it along the US-Mexico boundary. So within the terms of spectacle, not only have fencing and walling come to represent the only things that count as a border, along with high-tech surveillance and drones and things like this. But the routine and less visible violences of deterrence is naturalized both in the US-Mexico borderlands, but also elsewhere, such as the Caribbean. So this spectacular fix would serve to rationalize criminalization and fortification strategies, even as the US government was fundamentally undermining the right to seek asylum uh, in that space of the borderlands as well as the Caribbean. So I'm coming to a close by centering the narrative of our book on the Caribbean enabled us to make a two-pronged argument that undermining asylum, first, <laughs> undermining asylum has been fundamental to the formation of the US um, detention system and that this regime um, and its expansiveness is rooted in anti-Black racism. Um, through again, the relentless exclusion of Haitian people from the outset. So linking these two regions, US-Mexico borderland and the Caribbean, and the relationships between anti-Black and anti-Brown racism is important for understanding the interregional and transnational scope of deterrence, including the ways in which specific environments have been made into tools of deterrence. So the desert and seas have been made deadly to people on the move through the implementation of deterrence policies. So to reiterate the points I made at the outset, um, migration deterrence is transnational in scope and proceeds through blurring and invoking the space of the nation. So when thinking about migrant justice and rights to asylum, this means organizers and researchers need to be attentive to how migration deterrence involves civilian and military branches of government. It's not just ICE or CBP, which is daunting in itself given their scale. But if we approach migration deterrence through the lens of US empire, alert to how ideologies of foreign and domestic are deployed to undermine people's freedoms, this enables the movement uh, for migrant justice to think across agencies and link together groups that are already doing the work to challenge the violence of those agencies. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jenna. Thank you so much. Um, next, uh, we have Alison Muntz, uh, who's also a geographer and Canada Research Chair in Global Migration at Wilford uh, Laurier University. Uh, she moved to Canada from the U.S. in 1998 and has spent much of her life uh, researching the, that, that border, the, the U.S.-Canada uh, border, uh, where she explores how people migrate across borders, access migration and asylum policies, survive detention, resist war, create safe havens. Um, uh, Allison's earlier work, which I'm um, more uh, familiar with, is, is a, uh, actually around asylum. She wrote a really important book called Seeking Asylum, Human Smuggling and Bureaucracy at the Border. 
and um, also, you know, co-authored this book, uh, Boats, Borders, and Bases, that Jenna just presented on uh, race, the Cold War, and the rise of migrant detention, uh, and most recently, the death of asylum, hidden geographies of the enforcement um, archipelago. Sorry, I can't pronounce that. Um, Moons also directs uh, the International Migration Research Center. Uh, so welcome. It's it's such a it's such a delight to meet you in person. I only know your work, so I'm really excited that you're here joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Um, thanks, Nicole, also for the invitation, and to everyone at UIC for all of the labor, organizational, communicative that went into this event. It's a real privilege to be in conversation with all of you. I'm going to share my slides with you now. Let's see how that goes. Um, thanks so much, Jenna. I really appreciate that. And I'm going to pick up a little bit uh, where you left off. Nicole asked me to talk about the transnational um, component. And so I'm going to um, pan out a little bit to talk more about other geographical locations that we need to think through in, in relation um, to some of the US transnational histories of enforcement that Jenna just presented. I want to begin by saying that I live on the traditional territories of the Credit, Chippewa, and Wendat nations, and I work on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe, Neutral, and Haudenosaunee peoples. And I begin there because I think there are such important histories uh, to think through when we talk about contemporary situations uh, around enforcement, around displacement, um, that there are our through lines, connections to think through with settler colonial states and histories of dispossession and displacement that they are built on. Um, and so some of the places that I want to begin and end have to do with a decolonial standpoint and thinking through how um, settler colonial states practices of containing racialized people are historical and contemporary. Um, and with that, I want to begin with this image, which uh, is one of the borders that Jenna was just speaking of between um, Mexico and the United States. And with a quote overlaying it from um, Gloria Ansaldúa, whose work I often return to um, as a border studies scholar, because I think in her seminal text, Borderlands La Frontera, and in her body of work, she wrote about so many of the things that we research today um, as, as scholars, the proliferation of borders, um, the violence that they enact or that is enacted in their name, um, the ways that they are corporeal and lived in the body, um, the violence of displacement happening. And on Soldua's decolonial approach, um, her writing, uh, as a person growing up in the borderlands is something that I wanna connect um, towards the end of my talk to another scholar writing from the borderlands, um, Behrouz Bouchani and his Manus prison theory. Um, so I'll draw out some of those connections. But Jenna um, has pointed out the ways that we argued in our book, the spectacle of violence happening and enforcement happening along one border or land borders, which are sometimes more accessible to us, um, those of us living uh, on mainland territory, for example, hides another kind or obscures another set of enforcement practices um, happening at sea. And so um, in our book, we really tried to think about the relationship between these borders, between these places, um, and regions where um, asylum seeking, migration, and enforcement are, so, are all so um, heavily politicized. And Jenna really drew out this kind of interlocking um, relationship between the development of the detention system uh, on mainland territory and um, the detention of people in other people's countries, whether on military bases or through other kinds of contracting um, that happen, happened historically and happen today. So as I said, I wanna pick up where Jenna left off and think about how this history 
of US border enforcement in the Caribbean really planted seeds uh, for what we're experiencing today, what we can see happening around the globe. Um, it planted the development of tra transnational deterrence regimes, um, the politicization and criminalization of people seeking asylum and a policy model for export. And it's important to point out that it's not only um, people based in North America who are looking at how this particular model is being exported around the globe, but for example, scholars in Australia are writing about how the Australian offshore regime, um, how Australia's exploitation of other countries um, communities and resources for the purposes of detention are also being exported elsewhere. So this kind of continues in this cycle um, that is both geographical and historical and history of course repeats itself. So in the present, we find ourselves still in this moment or again in this moment of this intense politicization and exclusion. Um, and as Jenna mentioned, I come to this work through um, doing a lot of research over the years on the search for political asylum and, and government responses to that search. And, um, and in part through this project, the Island Detention Project, which really began from an empirical place of looking at the growth of detention on remote islands. This is not an exhaustive map by any means, but it gives you a sense of the idea that people um, crossing by boat are, are being intercepted and detained on islands. Um, and so the, the project looked at different regions, um, including US um, territories in the Pacific, uh, US detention, the Caribbean, also uh, Australia's detention in the Pacific region and Indian Ocean region, um, and off the southern shores of the shores of the European Union. And really um, what we see happening in these borderlands and on islands um, through the project came to be so much more than just looking at the islands. In other words, for me, the island became a prism through which to understand much broader global trends in migration. And so I'll name three of them here that converge on islands. One is a global rise in claims around asylum seeking, which of course mirrors the broader historical moment we're in with the highest rates of displacement globally. Um, uh, by last year, 2019, there were about three and a half million people awaiting the adjudication of their asylum claims. We also simultaneously see the global growth in detention and this continuing trend of the externalization of the border, this transnational extension uh, of enforcement. And these are just a couple of images to visualize what this looks like. This one is from the Global Detention Project based in Geneva. And I often point out when I show this map that one of the areas where detention has been growing for several years is in places that people are crossing en route to enter to make a claim, for example. So Mexico being a good example, people on their way to the United States or Canada are increasingly being detained and formally so through policy um, outside of the United States, so in Mexico. And that is a geographical trend in each of these regions. Um, as a result of all of this transnational enforcement and deterrence, um, there is so much harm happening um, as people continue to move because they need to for various reasons, um, but the enforcement renders them more precarious. And so there are so many activists and scholars around the globe who, are, who have been documenting border deaths. Um, so there are projects out of Australia and the European Union and the United States um, and Canada to document deaths. And this is an image from a publication from a small study that I did with Kira Williams uh, from a paper that we published in International Migration a couple of years ago. And what we did in this project was to study quantitatively um, how the border enforcement budgets um, that were going into policing at sea 
and, and to statistically analyze them alongside deaths at sea or the loss of human life at sea. And what you see here shows a very clear trend in terms of deaths over time that corresponds with that historical period that Jenna just brought us into across the 1990s and into the 2000s. And what we found in our analysis was a very clear and strong statistical correlation between increased enforcement at sea and deaths at sea. And this is not something new. This is something that people doing quantitative and qualitative research on the borderlands or indeed people traveling through the borderlands um, have known for a long time, which is that deterrence in fact doesn't work. In fact, it causes more harm. Um, or for shorthand here, I quote the feminist criminologist Sharon Pickering saying, there's no evidence that asylum seeker deterrence policy works. And that is important to remember um, because it is such an incredibly potent um, rationale, deterrence underlying so many contemporary policies around interception, around detention, and around some geopolitical deals that I want to talk about. Coming out of the island detention project, I think some of the most powerful evidence that deterrence policies do not work, such as interception and detention, um, are these individual migration journey maps. So this one is based on interviews that we did um, with a man from Afghanistan. We met him um, when he was in detention in Perth, Australia, which was after seven years uh, and four journeys trying to get from Afghanistan to Australia to make an asylum claim. During this period of time, he spent detention in various places um, in multiple countries. And the, on this map, the solid lines show his kind of forward migration towards his destination and the dotted lines are deportation routes. So this I, I think speaks volumes to um, the fact that in spite of the infrastructure of interception and detention and the intense investment in those resources, people also um, in, invest intensely in their own resources, household resources um, and incredible periods of time and difficulties endured trying to get somewhere. So this is what contemporary transnational migration journeys um, look like. So much of the transnational um, enforcement that we're talking about, uh, or specifically detention on islands um, that we studied through the project is really premised on the geographical imagination or what Svendrini Pereira calls the insular imagination, the idea that people, information about them um, can be controlled and isolated or that experimentation or really exploitation of island communities um, can be carried out and because it's more remotely located, somehow hidden from the view of national pu publics or international publics. And what we found in the Island Detention Project was a very clear repetition of this pattern where in um, powerful states uh, such as Australia or the United States that people are trying to reach by boat, um, increasingly invest in spreading this enforcement across the region, entering into all kinds of arrangements and geopolitical deals with countries um, to carry out enforcement and caught up in the morass are islands and island communities. They may have once been a space of passage or a safe haven that people first landed on to try to get somewhere to make a claim for asylum. But over time, the detention infrastructure is built up there and they become more carceral spaces. The capacity to detain there grows, borders and spaces of isolation proliferate and this um, erodes people's access, ability to access um, asylum in various ways. So this is a clear spatial pattern premised on racism, on fear, xenophobia, phobia, dehumanization, and multiple kinds of distancing. And just to show you some maps of what this looks like in the Australian or regional context, I'm not going to go into detail um, in this history, but I'm happy to talk more about it or refer you to some great scholarship on this history for those of you who are interested. But basically, so picking up again, sort of right after the time period that Jenna's talking about with the US under Clinton in the 1990s, 
um, we see Australia begin to uh, step up its interception at sea with a notorious incident in 2001 an interception of a Norwegian freighter carrying over 400 people on their way to seek asylum. The ship was in distress. The Sorry, the freighter picked up people from the ship in distress. And then Prime Minister John Howard refused to allow them to land um, in Australia. And if this was be the beginning of this whole regime that was referred to as the Pacific Solution. And in the time since then, um, successive governments have taken up more and more creative, aggressive forms of exclusion using things like the power of excision to declare Australia no longer part of Australia for the purposes of migration. So playing with geography and the law um, to deny people access to asylum. And in the research that we did on islands, what we found is that um, spaces of isolation within those communities proliferate. So for example, we saw the proliferation of detention on the small overseas Australian overseas territory of Christmas Island um, with the construction of facilities there, including a high security facility, which was the very first picture I showed you in my opening slide. Um, and over time, that facility was renovated to add solitary confinement cells there. Um, and so there's this deep, almost geographical irony happening of the um, island within the island within the island, the confinement cell within the high security facility on the remote island surrounded by rough waters, which is very difficult to reach. So we see this proliferation of islands within islands and detention facilities across the region through all of these bilateral arrangements. And this is what that map starts to look like, the spread of the kind of regional archipel enforcement archipelago. So <clears throat> what does this look like transnationally? We can think about how this um, set of practices moves from the United States into the Caribbean, from the United States to its uh, Pacific territory, such as the unincorporated, what the US calls the unincorporated territory of Guam and Saipan. We can see how it moves to Australia and Australia implements these practices and detention facilities on Christmas Island, on Nauru, on uh, Papua New Guinea's Manus Island, uh, across Indonesia. And we can continue to track the movement of both interception offshore and also the use of islands specifically as a transnational deterrence st strategy as something punitive meant to prevent people from moving or prevent future people from moving. Um, most recently, the Bangladeshi government has been building up the Silt Island of Bazanchar to move um, Rohingya refugees to that island. It's been heavily criticized because the island is in the path of um, tropical storms during cyclone season. Denmark similarly imported the model, the Australian model from Manus and Nauru, um, rehabilitating a facility on a small island about 80 kilometers from Copenhagen. And most recently it came to light that the UK Home Office was similarly proposing and debating um, placing people on uh, islands, asylum seekers on islands. And so I, I, I lay out this kind of pattern and history in, in my new book, The Death of Asylum. And in the book, I really argue that engaging island studies scholars, that we move islands from the kind of geographical periphery of thinking about migration governance to the center of thinking um, that what is happening on islands with detention portends what's happening elsewhere. And when I started um, thinking through these issues and writing about them, I used to write about the erosion of access to asylum, the shrinking of paths to asylum. But over time, um, researching what was happening, the intensification of these trends, and also reading scholarship by people like Lisa Cacho writing about social death and Judith Butler's work on precarious life, um, I developed a stronger argument about the death of asylum and, uh, and consider that on the one hand, yes, there are uh, many physical deaths uh, of people. This is a memorial on Christmas Island to remember a boat that sank 
en route from, from Sumatra Island to Christmas Island in 2001. Um, but not only are there physical deaths, there, there's the ontological death of the very category of the asylum seeker, which is becoming impossible, more and more difficult to inhabit, and also a political death. In other words, by hiding so much of this enforcement, um, we find it more difficult to argue politically against the very rationales um, that were set forth, um, the deterrence rationales that were set forth and driving all of this activity. They become lost in this um, persistent, um, this persistent uh, ideology and incredible material um, infrastructure of, inc of exclusion. Um, and I just want to wrap up by saying briefly some of what I've been thinking about recently in the time since the book came out. Um, the book opens with an obituary, which is engaging Judith Butler's idea that we that an obituary is an opportunity for public to distribute public grief. Um, but maybe it's not the case that we want to dwell on the death of asylum, which after all was a system set up by nation states um, to uh, exclude and also determine whose life was a, a life worth preserving or, or human rights worth preserving as Hannah Arendt and others argued over the years. Um, so what are we left with in the kind of aftermath, the morass of this infrastructure that, we're, that we've been studying? Um, what is the afterlife of protection when asylum is no longer um, accessible. And here I want to posit three things and then I'll end. Um, the first is island detention itself, right? So island detention was never set up because it was some robust and fair, efficient, you know, processing of asylum claims. Um, the whole thing was set up to, to exclude and to deter and really built on the colonial histories that enabled the exploitation of island communities who found it difficult to say no when um, certain states come knocking to ask for detention to be carried out there for this kind of outsourcing. Um, we also have to think about the afterlife of island detention and asylum seeking um, that people live, right? So in our field, in feminist geography, there are a lot of people writing about intimate geopolitics. What are the lived experiences of detention and of its closure? What is the aftermath? Um, what happens over generations? How do people live out histories of racialized violence and separation of families? And both people who were detained and also island communities whose, uh, who, where the social and economic fabric of the community was overtaken for a while by the detention industry, um, what happens there in, after its departure. And the third thing that I wanna think about is kind of from a policy perspective, which is the increasing practice of the deal. In other words, geopolitical arrangements bilateral things signed between countries um, to kind of resettle people in the aftermath of some of what I've been talking about. And from a US perspective, some of you might remember that President Obama signed one of these deals with Australia right before he left office. Trump then came into office and called it a dumb deal, notoriously hung up on Malcolm Turnbull in a phone call that the, was later released as a transcript by The Guardian. But interestingly, this deal uh, went through quietly. And so this was a deal wherein the United States would resettle up to 1,200 people who had been detained on Manus and um, Nauru. And in exchange, Australia would resettle up to 50 Central American asylees. And so this is not the first time that Australia and the US have signed such a deal. In fact, in the past, the US has sent Haitian asylees on a plane to Australia in exchange. So these are like, again, premised on the notion of deterrence that although people have been found um, to be so-called convention refugees, they're not uh, welcomed. So they are resettled elsewhere. And the, the deals are getting more deals, the EU-Turkey deal being the largest one, 
uh, deals between Italy and Libya, and they've been he heavily criticized. Um, but they are, I think, also a part of this ongoing transnational deterrence regime that we're talking about. And I'll end by just mentioning, um, I wanted to return to um, some of the work of and writing of Behrouz Bouchani, who some of you might know is an Iranian journalist who was detained on Manus Island for several years, um, recently, recent, only recently released and is now in New Zealand. Um, he's the author, this is an image from his film with Arash Sarvastani, Choka, Please Tell Us the Time, which was made clandestinely on Manus. Um, and he also is the author of No Friend But the Mountains. And I think, you know, like um, Gloria Ansaldua, he's really writing from a place um, in the borderlands of experiencing detention and the violence of borders. And together with his translator um, and another scholar, Omid Tofi Gyanari, um, Omid and Behrouz are writing about something called Manus prison theory, um, which is really a decolonial theory uh, that in their words is an intellectual and political project for the purposes of truth telling and transformation. And they urge us to connect histories and different forms of violence and domination to join in their project of dismantling the detention industry and um, challenging the borders that divide people. And so I wanna join them in the, in the work that they're doing and also Jenna in saying that I think any position around abolishing ICE, we also need to make um, uh, transnational solidarities around organizing to also abolish the, the broader transnational deterrence regimes um, that the US is part of, thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, next, we have Naomi Pike, uh, who's an associate professor of Asian American studies uh, with appointments in gender and women's studies and history at uh, the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana. Uh, Naomi has published the award-winning book, Rightslessness, Testimony and Redress in U.S. Prison Camps Since World War II, uh, and most recently, um, the timely book, Bands, Walls, Raids, Sanctuary, uh, which is examining and calling for um, the need for radical abolitionist approaches to sanctuary. So it's great to have you here, Naomi. Okay. Okay, thank you guys so much for being here and uh, thank everyone for organizing this amazing conversation. Um, I especially wanna thank uh, Nicole Nguyen, the Race and US Empire Group and the Institute for the Humanities for bringing us together. And um, I deeply respect the brilliant women on this panel and I'm hugely honored to be in conversation with you. Um, I also want to thank Yvonne Arenas, Linda Vavra, and the many people whose invisible labor uh, makes this event possible. Um, I'm truly grateful for everyone on this panel. Um, everyone's work here has uh, influenced my own thinking in so many ways. I remember when I first read Both Borders and Basis, I was like, oh my God, I wish this had come out before rightlessness so that I could incorporate more of its arguments into my own work. And I also wanna give a special shout out to Jenna um, who reviewed the manuscript for the Bands Walls Raid Sanctuary um, and made it so much better with her incisive critiques. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the book, but um, I also wanted to, and um, uh, responding to Nicole's uh, kind of framing, I, I wanted to kind of weave together some of the different points that Jenna and Allison made in their comments as well. So I'm gonna try and be thinking a little bit on the fly um, towards the end of my comments. Um, okay, so I'm gonna start sharing my screen. Okay, so um, I just published this book. And um, in the book, I examine how in the US we got to this point. So it is a very US centric book in part because it's responding to the ascension of 45, right? So I wanted to think about how did we get here um, where we democratically elected a white supremacist authoritarian who wants to take the country back to its white nationalist patriarchal roots. Um, and so the basic arg argument of the book, I hope you'll still buy it, um, is that the problem is not Donald Trump. The problem is the United States of America. 
Um, and I flesh out this argument by tracing uh, these contemporary immigration crises back to two foundational moments. So first is the settler colonial foundations in the US, which sought not only to destroy, to replace the indigenous civilizations already here, but also continuously strives to exclude racial others by deporting, hiding, or criminalizing them or otherwise revoking the right of racialized outsiders to be within the invaded territory, as Kelly Lotto Hernandez states so well. Um, the second foundational moment is the emergence of federal immigration restrictions in the late 19th century, which occurred at the closing of the frontier and which have always been shaped by racism, capitalist labor exploitation, fears of disease and disability, and so on. Um, and we can see these origins in the Chinese Exclusion Acts, which targeted Chinese women and workers, incorporating gender, race, and class-based exclusions into this original ban. And then furthermore, um, once it got started, the federal government really got on a roll, and it quickly turned to target any convict, lunatic, idiot, or any person likely to become a public charge. And it continues and continues, right? So a few decades later, the US passed the 1924 Johnson-Reed Act, which is considered the legislative achievement of the eugenics movement. It was boosted by the Klan and it was admired by Hitler in his uh, memoir, Mein Kampf. Um, that year, the same year, um, the US uh, Congress also created the Border Patrol, which has always targeted Mexican migrants in particular. Um, but as uh, Allison and Jenna have already said, these restrictions have never achieved their goal of stopping people from migrating. And we have long, known, people in government have long known this. So um, as Labor Secretary James Davis notes in 1927, we couldn't stop them. Not even a Chinese wall 9,000 miles in length and built over rivers and deserts and mountains and along seashores would seem to permit a permanent solution. And yet we keep pursuing these failed policies with ever increasing intensity, especially over the last 50 years or what we now call the era of neoliberalism. So the book really picks up speed when we get to this era, which, over, over, which also overlaps with the um, historical periods that Jenna and Allison's, Mount, Allison's um, work uh, uh, engages with. Right? So it picks up speed when we get to this era as it tracks the increasing intensity of criminalization and carceral logics on which neoliberalism depends. So as I discuss in the book, neoliberal governance in the US invested in capital, divested from labor and society and dealt with the fallout of that organized abandonment by disciplining surplus populations, justifying all of this by capitalizing on fears of economic insecurity and displacing them onto scapegoated others. So the state has dealt with the fallout of that organized abandonment in part by investing more and more into law and order regimes, policing and incarceration. And this is why Ruthie Gilmore argues that the neoliberal state is built upon prison foundations. So globally, neoliberal governance has also promoted the free movement of capital and goods while also demanding a lockdown on the mobility of people, right? So the concurrent authorization of NAFTA NAFTA and of the prevention through deterrence policy that um, uh, Jenna just uh, uh, talked about um, sheds light on this contradiction between the demands of capital for maximum profits and for the cheapest labor force and the demands of the nation state for sovereign control over its territory. So the US both promoted NAFTA as a solution to undesirable migration from Mexico, saying that it would lift all boats, um, all the economies would rise together. Um, but at the same time, it, uh, it also admitted um, before Congress that NAFTA would require strengthening our enforcement efforts at the border, which we did. Right? So the US knew that migration would increase because they knew that NAFTA would shock the Mexican economy, especially for poor and working class people. Right? And at the same moment, it passes the prevention through deterrence policy that sealed off those high traffic um, crossing points near urban areas like San Diego, Tijuana or El Paso, um, Juarez, and funneled those migrants into the Sonoran Desert where thousands of migrants have perished. So obviously this border, control, this border control strategy, which builds in danger and death into its logic, 
um, did not start in 1994, and it is not just a US phenomenon, as both Jenna and Allison have explained. So as they have emphasized in their book, Bo Boats, Borders, and Faces, the strategy had already been tested and worked out in the 1970s and 80s against Black Caribbean migrants traveling by sea, especially Haitian migrants. <clears throat> so in an example of what Mounts calls mobile state enforcement, the US extended its borders into international waters to intercept small boats in the Caribbean and send them back to Haiti in a novel, it's a newly innovated interdiction program set up with the repressive Haitian government, government that those very migrants were fleeing from, right? Also in the early 1990s, following um, a mass out-migration out from Haiti, following the coup d'etat against um, jean bertrand Aristide, the US deployed the tactic of remoteness um, to deny Haitian refugees from claiming asylum by indefinitely detaining them at the Guantanamo Bay Naval Base, which um, Allison, um, Jenna, and I all talk about in our books, right? So we see these similar strategies deployed not only in the US, but also elsewhere by the European Union in its interventions in the Mediterranean and, the, and by Australia in its Pacific solution that has sent migrants to indefinite detention um, in Manus Island and in Nauru. Okay. So these border regimes are thinly justified via a kind of humanitarian carcerality that subjects migrants to violence, death, and imprisonment while gutting the meaning and existence of asylum itself as Mounts um, argues so powerfully. So um, <clears throat> these strategies are also, as uh, uh, Allison and uh, Jenna have just explained, these are not just isolated to watery spaces. And just as the United States has weaponized the Sonoran Desert as part of its enforcement strategy, the Sahel region of Africa has claimed more migrant lives than the Mediterranean, but these lost lives don't land in public consciousness in the same way and on the same scale, in part because it is more removed from the borders of Europe, which is the space where lives get to count, right, or get to be cast as a problem. Um, so this speaks back to um, what Allison was talking about in terms of the way that she's drawing on Judith Butler and um, speaks back to that question of whose deaths count and whose deaths never registers because their lives never counted as lives in the first place. So what these ever escalating bordering strategies of states show over and over and over again is that they are guaranteed to fail. Right? both because of the steadfast ingenuity of migrants themselves and because of the fact that borders do not address root causes of migration. So the, the folks on this panel um, have shown uh, the great lengths that people will go to in order to reach a place where their lives can be livable. Right? So um, Mounts uh, opens uh, the introduction of her book with the story of Khalil, for example, an 18-year-old Afghan uh, migrant who traveled through Pakistan, Iran, Turkey, and Greece, and Italy via foot, uh, dinghy, and truck. Um, and uh, he also encounters various means that states in the EU use to contain and expel him, including detention. And then similarly in the Americas, we see migrants from all over the world, right? From Asia, Africa, and the Caribbean, traveling from South America, right? All the way up, through the Americas up to our southern border, navigating by plane, tr uh, bus, train, foot, um, ferrying across uh, dangerous rivers, um, and negotiating various states' border regimes along the way. So um, the the border migrant crisis um, at the southern border is often cast as mostly Central Americans and Mexicans, but there are also many South Asian migrants, Haitians, Cubans, many people from all over the world, right? Uh, <clears throat> and so um, this question of transit migration is something that I think um, we're trying to kind of elucidate and bring to the foreground, right? So these shared conditions across different spaces and shared border enforcement strategies illustrate the insufficiency of thinking about migration, immigration, and border, and border regimes nation by nation, or even region by region. Um, so, you know, when I'm talking about uh, the abolitionist approach to sanctuary in these other book talks, I often get the question, well, it sounds like you're arguing for a borderless world as if this is something completely unfathomable or unachievable ever, right? And my answer is always yes. Um, but as someone who is learning from abolitionist models, I also answer that creating the borderless world 
not just in the US, but globally, is not just about dismantling these enforcement regimes that subject thousands of people across the world to detention, expulsion, and death in all kinds of horrifying ways, including by their own hands, right? It is also about creating conditions globally where no one has to leave their lives, homes, and communities just to survive. Okay, so creating that world without the violence of borders requires an entire and whole um, holistic reimagining of obligations and accountability to each other across vast spaces, right? So this gets back to that question of empire as well. And since US empire is everywhere, we are accountable to everyone who is coming here, right? Um, so it requires uh, reimagining our obligations and accountability to each other rather than our current uh, system, which has pledged fealty to corporate capital at the expense of life itself, right? So to bring this back to the title um, of today's panel, um, the abolish ICE hashtag crystallizes a range of organizing strategies that are not solely limited to dismantling the institution of state terrorism against immigrant communities in the United States. It is also about dismantling criminalization altogether. Um, oh, sorry, I meant to uh, show you these. This is the Guantanamo Haitian uh, or refugee camp for Haitian refugees. Okay. Um, okay, so it's not, it, it is also about dismantling criminalization altogether, which ends up ensnaring all kinds of people made vulnerable by state violence and capitalist exploitation, immigrant and citizen alike. Okay, and it's also about dismantling border regimes that not only subject so many people to suffering and death on their journeys, um, but also justify their exploitation, marginality, and subjection to violent removals once in the United States. So this is, um, this is from a group there on Instagram called Thoughty Organizer, and they started making these kind of shirts and interventions in part to clarify what we mean when we say abolish ICE, right? And I think the challenge for this more abolitionist approach to border regimes and to ICE is to make these connections not only among states, but also among communities of resistance and survival across vast spaces. So I wanna ask, and these are like actual questions, not just rhetorical ones. I wanna ask um, what kinds of connections can we make between, for example, alarm phone, which is a phone hotline supporting migrants crossing the Mediterranean, like if they have distress calls, and no mas mortis, or no more deaths, which is providing life-saving water and support for migrants crossing the Sonoran Desert. Um, are there ways that we could maybe connect the efforts of faith communities across Europe, like the ones who are holding continuous religious services without breaks in order to provide sanctuary for migrants under the threat of deportation to those sanctuary churches and jurisdictions in the United States? Right, so that I think there's lots of these different connections that we can explore more. And then what is our role as like people in the academy and um, access to certain kinds of resources to facilitate these conversations and connections. And I also wanna connect the particular challenges and possibilities for immigrant and migrant justice in settler colonial states like the United States, Australia and New Zealand. Um, so as I argue at the end of the Vans Walls Raids book, um, these states are not, um, settler colonial states are not the original um, or legitimate sovereigns on the territories they claim as their own. And that they thus do not have the final say on who or what comes into the territory or exclusive ownership over who and what counts as human. Okay. Um, so those two quotes um, come from Nick Estes, um, which he stated at the welcoming ceremony that members of the Tongva nation and other indigenous people held for those migrants excluded by the Muslim ban. Okay. So acknowledging that settler states exist on territory seized through theft raises the question of whether I get to claim this land as my own and whether I have the right to prevent anyone else from settling here as well as the historian Elizabeth Ellis of the Peoria tribe of Oklahoma argues. And indeed, multiple indigenous na nations offer alternative mo models of relationality and nationhood that may help us reimagine solutions. And these models conceive of belonging and affiliation with each other through reciprocal obligations among humans and resources and one that sees consensual incorporation and inclusion as a way to expand power rather than as a threat, as Ellis notes. Okay, so we can see um, other examples of this configuration of our relations to each other in the case of Beirut's Buchani, 
um, that Allison, who Allison just mentioned. Um, he is the Kurdish Iranian asylum seeker, author, filmmaker, journalist, and activist who had been swept up and detained for nearly seven years on Manas Island by the Australian state as part of its Pacific solution. So similar to the indigenous activists who welcomed those excluded by the Muslim ban, Maori representatives from Christchurch welcomed Buchani when he first arrived to their country, first as a guest at a literary festival and then as an asylum seeker. Faculty of the Nai Tahu Research Center of Canterbury University further offered him a fellowship in indigenous studies, right? in part because Buchani was forced from his home in Iran because of his publications in Kurdish about Kurdish problems and issues. Right? Um, he has risen as a global figure because of his writings that demand the abolition of border security regimes. So he is both an indigenous person and a migrant and an asylum seeker who is now asking to move to the settler colony of New Zealand. So what is going on with these different kinds of layers, right, between migration and indigeneity and what kind of um, connections of solidarity might he and other people like him be able to um, raise for us? So I want to think about these connections we can make not uh, make across these not so disparate sites and locations. And um, I also want to ask what kinds of grounds for solidarity can we foster, not just across those borders of nation states and settler colonies, but also across those dividing the settler from the arrivant, from the migrant and the indigenous person, and across those other kinds of borders that set us apart from each other. So I will end there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for those uh, three fabulous presentations. And Naomi, thank you for doing the, the work of making all of the connections. You always do a really great job uh, on the fly. So I appreciate that. Um, we're going to start the Q&A section now. So if you want to drop a question in the Q&A, um, we'll get to it. Patricia, I don't know if you, you had a question first you wanted to ask. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I, as you all know, I'm, I'm also a, a border scholar. And so I, I have a ton of questions. Okay, so here's, here's a question I think that that's building off of all of your um, comments. So I was, uh, one is it's sort of a little bit about kind of border, kind of border studies, border research. And then it's also like a political question as well that I think um, kind of builds off of Naomi. So, one, I think I'm, I want to ask a question about like just the whole framework of deterrence that is you're using in your work that, that I think is super important on the one hand, but then it, it also, as I try to reimagine how to do this work as a border scholar, it occurs to me that that framework of deterrence is very much a framework of the state in some ways. It's, it's oftentimes with border scholarship we take the discourses of policymakers and we build our research around it. And so with border studies, I think that that's what happened where you know you had all these kind of border escalations and then you had all these researchers studying borders and saying, is this, is this effective? Is this not effective? And so you have this whole body of border studies research that is all about, no, this is not effective. Yes, this is effective. And there's a way in which the very framing of that study was not created by us, those of us who want to challenge these things. And so I was a little bit struck by, you know, just the, the framing of, of deterrence and, and it's, you know, this doesn't work, you know. And there's a way in which those kinds of arguments don't always work with Trump supporters, you know what I mean? Because it's, it's and so, so there's something there that I felt I, I really kind of wanted to question. But then on the other hand, just knowing your work and respecting your work tremendously, I could also see like other ways of thinking about, you know, border scholarship, you know, when you were talking about, you know, the prison theory, um, Allison, or, you know, the questions that Naomi was asking, or, you know, just the reframing of the types of sites or, you know, and things like that. So. So I, I guess it's more of a, I was wondering if that's something that you grappled with in your work or if I'm, I'm missing that he, here, but it's just, um, I think just as someone who grew up on the border it, and, and who everything I've read has been written by men, by white men, by, 
it's like, I just need something different, <laughs> you know, in talking about the border. So, and the reason I'm asking it is because I'm really interested in these kinds of coalitions and, you know, solidarities that is, it's absolutely necessary that we, that we build that, right? And so I think that the follow-up question to that is, is kind of building off of Naomi's thing about how do we build these solidarities. I was thinking of, you know, the fact that there are all these national conversations, global conversations around policing and Black Lives Matter. And like, how do you see like kind of people who do the work that we do around borders, around deportation, around detention, how do you see us like engaging um, in these? Notice I'm not asking how can we talk about deportation in Black Lives Matter? That's not what I'm asking. I'm asking how can us as border scholars and detention and deportation engage with these national conversations around policing? And then I think Yvonne Arenas also has a question in the chat that's kind of related to COVID and things like that. So sorry about all that, but your talks inspired it. <laughs> Does someone want to take a, a, a try at answering that set of questions? Uh, I can I can start just start um, by saying thank you for that. I agree um, that so much of our language and thinking and acting is so responsive, isn't it, to the violence that is unfolding, um, whether it's discursive or physical violence. Um, there are so many different forms of violence, I think, embedded in, in our presentations and in, in the bordering that we've been talking about. I guess I'll just start with one example of a group that I talk about briefly in the book which is this group called Lampedusa in Berlin that I had a chance to meet one time in Berlin and spend a little time with. Um, and this is a group of people who are living in Berlin who, who came um, from many different countries, um, many through attempting to access asylum and get legal status, but not succeeding. Um, and one thing that they hold in common biographically is having spent time in detention on Lampedusa. And they, they um, for years, were occupying different public spaces in Berlin um, to call attention to their own rejection of the state system that failed to recognize their humanity and their presence. Um, and rejecting you know the kind of capitalist city that didn't allow affordable places to live like calling into uh, visibility um, and um, calling residents of the city to account for their their plight and their presence and so i think there are people who are organizing locally and transnationally who are rejecting um, the terms of colonial systems that never recognized the violence that was um, part of their displacement. And the kind of, I think, relationships of accountability that Naomi was talking about at the end of your talk. I love the connections that you were, that you were drawing. So I think um, it's, our, it's, our, it's our responsibility and, and, and always my hope as a scholar um, to find uh, people who are who are better than we are sometimes, you know, as academics at, um, you know, that whole you know, idea that the tools will never you know, the, dismantle the master's house, like that we can't always work in relation to the violent policies that we're studying or that are harming people. We also have to look for something um, that rejects them and, and that those movements exist. Um, and so it goes back to one of Naomi's questions of how do we join them? How do we learn from them and move out of this place that you so, I think, aptly described? 
I think I'll jump in and try to organize the remaining questions into one big question um, since we're short on time. Um, but I guess, how do, how do we think about the current context? So both the rising populism in the US, the closing of borders uh, in response to the pandemic, um, how are those reconfiguring the de deterrence regime or migration practices? Um, how might this response strengthen US empire globally? And then three, what are the most pressing scholarly projects to take up going forward with sort of these issues around policing, prisons, detention, deportation in mind? I might go back to um, Patricia's question just real quick, real quick. Um, so like, I totally understand um, the kind of thrust of the question that um, a lot of our border scholarship or uh, scholarship about migration and borders um, is uh, somewhat reactive to what is the state doing? And I fully understand that that is what I'm doing because I am interested in understanding what the state is doing and how it's doing it and how it's justifying it. Because I feel like um, I want to put my critical eye on the violence of the state because I don't want, I basically am motivated by, by things that I hate. And I hate state violence and I hate camps and I hate borders and like all of these things. So I want to understand how do they actually function and operate? How are they legitimized in the law, et cetera, et cetera, so that we have better strategies to attack them. Right and dismantle them, and I think that's that's like one side of the project. But the other side is what Allison is kind of talking about and looking to where we're not going to find answers to the state, right? We're not going to find new visions or solutions to the state. So we have to look elsewhere for that, and we have to think creatively of, amongst ourselves, but also looking at those who are di most directly affected by these regimes, and then also thinking about like where else do we find it? So I remember Nicole at a different event we were doing together, you brought up Beloved as like, and like the creative arts and things like this as resources for us. And then also histories of resistance, not just what's going on right now, but like there's a lot of things that have happened historically that give us some kind of guidance for leaning towards our imaginative like capacities to think beyond the state. But I think both of these things are really important. Um, to, to grapple with at the same time. But I totally understand what you're talking about and that we don't want to limit our analyses to what the state is doing. Um, and then also, um, Nicole. Yeah, just to clarify, no, the state and state violence absolutely matters. I think it's just sometimes there's, there's a lot of research that's policy-centered and efficacy-based. And I'm specifically talking about that approach to studying that. So but I totally agree with you and appreciate the response. Thank you. Yeah. And I think we also have to kind of not think about immigration and borders in terms of these policy abstractions, but in terms of thinking about their effects on real people, places, and environments. So, yeah. Would anyone? Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to ask. I pick up on the, the, deterrence, the deterrence question. I mean, I think that. Um, you know, if anything, these moments of reform that Allison and I were writing about were ones um, that there were all of these ideas like, oh, well, we can make it, we can make it better, we can make it more effective, whether it's through like, like alternatives to detention, which becomes like incarceration, right? Um, and if anything, part of what we were trying to show within the terms of the state itself was that, um, it wasn't going to work within their terms and like towards that direction. And at the same time, part of how it is that I think people working within a reform framework as advocates um, or as um, agents of the state don't actually in some ways, it's like some people do, uh, some other people don't, don't fully recognize the the, the full violence of it and that at its core um, there is a violence to it um, and so trying to undo the possibility of there being a reform the only possibility would be an abolition um, in many ways because the constant deferral like there's an escalating logic to criminalization to deterrence to everything that we've been talking about such that we could 
this place where violence takes place, but that doesn't end it, right? Um, or continue to amplify it, but that doesn't end the violence. Um, it just might make it more quiet. So I think that part of also trying to explain the escalation and this, like the, the escalation and the central violence of state deterrence practices too, is in part to talk to some people within within activist circles or advocacy circles about what it is that the ask is. So for example, in 2014, when all of the images were coming out about child detention, I was immediately nervous that, that um, in people first seeing those images would say, this is terrible, which it was, but that they would ask for better cages rather than kids not being in cages. And that's precisely what we ended up seeing. So um, to the extent that there are greater numbers of people <laughs> who are appalled by the state violence and also recognize the deterrent sort of aspect the, and the escalating logic of um, the system as a whole, the ask could be something else. <laughs> rather than a better detention system, it could be like kids don't belong, kids and adults don't belong in cages, right? Um, so, but yeah, that's absolutely tricky because on one level saying deterrence doesn't work, but it does do other things, right? It does produce violence. It does produce these, um, it does produce race. It does leave scars on people um, and um, uh, both physically and, and um, and mentally, it also um, brings together the deterrent effects of say Europe, um, different places in the country is part of why we have also people from all over the world who are um, trying to seek asylum along the US-Mexico boundary. So it also brings people together, right? Um, in ways that certainly was not what was intended by those states. So yeah, those questions that were asked um, and Patricia um, by you and also the um, people who have been attending, um, right? I think precisely are some of the unintended uh, consequences, but also the sort of global scale really of thinking these systems, these systems together. Um, both in terms of research, but really in terms of organizing. What is transnational organize, like organizing by groups of transnational people who happen to end up in one place? What is that going to produce? It's, I, it's going to produce some amazing things as far as I anticipate. Yeah, thanks so much, Jenna, for that response. And thanks to the three of you again for your presentations. I'm cognizant of time. Um, so I just want to thank you and, you know, based on like the questions and the conversation, this could go on, this conversation could go on for, for much longer, um, but of course we all have to get back to the work itself. Um, so I just want to thank you, thank you all and let folks know that um, IRPP will make the recording available, they'll send it out uh, through the registration email link um, if you registered and they'll let you know when and where to find that video. So thanks so much everyone. Thank you so much.